um, he cares, um, and those are the kind of artists we like to see on our show. While rehearsals continue here at Madison Square Garden for Sunday night's big show, stars conduct backstage to check out the gift lounge. The lounge is filled with free goodies from jewelry to skincare products to sunglasses. Over the years, Ricky Martin and Alicia Keys and Mary J. Blige have actually worn the glasses they picked up in the lounge on the Grammy red carpet. So even nominees who failed to win still won't go home empty-handed. Nikki Batiste, CBS News, New York. And you know it's a special occasion when Patriots owner Robert Kraft shows up. He was spotted yesterday chilling with Jay-Z. Yeah, at the Rock Nation brunch. So everyone's rolling. in New York for the weekend. And also the story of that Bronx teacher who is mm -hmm. just transforming the lives of students. I cannot wait to see that. I love the Grammys, but I cannot yes. wait to see that part of it. We Man. saw that story and it, it was, we had to hold back we tears. Did. We oh, really God. did. It was. I really wasn't crying, you were crying, back. Very close, very close. <laughs> you know me. But anyway, here's what we have uh, looking ahead to the next few days. Uh, it looks like it's going to turn colder. It can't stay mild like this forever, obviously, in January. But we'll be close to 50 this afternoon and the rain will be slow to end on the New England south coast. It's already done everywhere else. And then tomorrow we may have, try to get a few breaks of but basically a kind of a gray day. Tuesday, there could be a few snow showers in the morning. That ocean storm just at sea, but we'll have a chance of a coating to an inch or so over southeastern Massachusetts. It's sunny and cold on Wednesday. And then Friday, we have the risk of snow, and it may be an accumulation uh, snow event with uh, especially southeastern Mass, but that's so many days away. Just cannot be specific about that just yet. But uh, colder weather is definitely on the way. All right, All right Barry, Barry Burbank looking ahead for us. Now, my friends, it is time for our look back at the blizzard of 78. That's next. It'll be a good one. Stay mm -hmm. with us. Remember, we're always on the web, cbsboston.com, for news updates around the clock. Have a great Sunday. Boston's most watched 11 o'clock news, WBZ News at 11. Welcome to the WBZ Ion Weather Blizzard of 78 Winter Special. It was a catastrophic, historic, and now infamous nor'easter. Storm Larry, as it was referred to in Connecticut, began Monday morning, February 5th, and continued through February 7th. Snowfall records were broken from Atlantic City to Providence to Boston as well as this winter behemoth grew to extreme intensity. This historic storm would claim more than 100 lives, cause 4,500 injuries and almost $2 billion of damage in today's money. Now we've assembled the entire WBZ weather team to take a look back at the impact the blizzard had on New England, if such a thing could maybe happen again someday, and walk down memory lane with a former WBZ meteorologist. Plus, we'll check in with this year's outlook and what's expected for the second half of our winter season. Now, to start things off, it's wild to think that enough time has passed so that many might not even recall this storm. Now, for those who may not know the tale and for those who remember every second of it, here's a look at what 78 looked like through the eyes of WBZ and our viewers. A record winter storm with hurricane force winds is causing serious problems all throughout southern New England. Weather is miserable. The traffic is miserable. If you're inside, stay there. We've got winds lasting for a long time. We have heavier snow lasting for a long time. And take the combination of the two, and you have perhaps the worst winter storm we've ever had here in New England. This is the parking lot, formerly known as Route 128. An extremely high tide and hurricane force winds have flooded dozens of homes, and thousands of homes are now in danger. A storm that has only gained more notoriety with time. The blizzard of 78 is the benchmark storm for generations of New Englanders. The start of the bread and milk phenomenon. The first continuous weather coverage on local TV. And most importantly, the tremendous effect it had on the lives of countless people. Governor Michael Dukakis is touring our snow-stricken area by helicopter. The impact on the coastal communities is really uh, devastating. We saw houses just smashed around like matchsticks, slumber all over the ground, seawalls broken up and now freezing. The blizzard struck on a day where many went to work in school, thinking the talked about potential storm wouldn't pan out to be that bad. By the end of the day, it was a full-fledged disaster. Shelby Scott is still snowbound. Even WBZ's intrepid reporter Shelby Scott was trapped at home, unable to report from the blinding snow. The heavy wind and the heavy snow are combining to make this potentially the worst storm ever to hit New England. Not unlike many other powerful storms, it had humble beginnings as a weak area of low pressure off the Carolina coast. But in a matter of hours, it became a major nor'easter 
as polar energy plunged across the Appalachians and intensified the system. The state of emergency will continue this evening and all day tomorrow. What made the blizzard of 78 such a unique storm system? We had sharp polar energy that was diving down to the coast, captured the storm system. High pressure over eastern Canada, kind of blocking its path. And as it moved up south of Long Island, it stalled, did a loop, and then headed off toward the north and east. And it was this slow drifting motion that lashed New England with destructive waves, strong winds, heavy snowfall for nearly two straight days. Senator Edward Kennedy is now on the phone from Washington. Senator Kennedy, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Jack. I think we've got some uh, helpful news from Washington. The president has signed the declaration uh, proclamation, which uh, makes Massachusetts a disaster area. When it was finally over, the region was transformed. Here it is the morning after the great storm. The road is empty. As you know, it is the day after the great storm and part of a time that we'll be talking about for probably many years to come. Many of us have been here for several days. We're running out of clothes and hope that this emergency is over soon. The Chatham area where the water has broken through the Dawson Bar and North Beach and several areas down by Coast Guard Beach, down in the Provincetown area, the tide came up higher than the Army engineers ever figured would ever happen once in a hundred years. It happened yesterday. A state travel ban did not happen again until 2013. The snowfall record in Boston fell in 2003. The tide record fell earlier this month. Other storms have destroyed homes, breached dunes, flooded streets, and trapped drivers. But for most, nothing will quite live up to the ordeal in early February of 1978. There was quite an uproar when it was declared that a blizzard in 2003 beat the snowfall record in Boston. Many still strongly believe that 78 is the king, and they refuse to accept it. But Danielle, a lot of storms bring feet of snow to New England. Very few bring this type of coastal destruction. I mean, the destruction along the coast was unimaginable, and the memories still remain fresh in the minds of residents that went through it. The blizzard of 78 is the first storm that ever did any major damage to the house. I mean, it totally wrecked the house. Jim Barry was a teenager when the powerhouse storm hit New England and demolished parts of his family's home along Gun Rock Beach in Hull. His mother, Barbara, recounts the damage to their porch. From underneath, the waves came and took it right off, the roof and all. The Barrys say their neighborhood was a war zone. Three houses over, there was a big family house, four family house, and that just totally fell into the water. They weren't allowed to build up again. But the Barrys could and did rebuild. Jim's dad and uncles redesigned the porch, poured concrete, and spent the entire spring and summer of 78 hammering nails with their kids. I'm sure if we hadn't done all this work, that storm the other day would have demolished the rest of the house. This January's blizzard showed us that we can have flooding rivaling that from the blizzard of 78. In fact, the tidal gauges reached record levels on January 4th, the big difference in 78 was the duration of the storm, with flooding persisting for several high tide cycles. We got a glimpse of what the future shoreline could look like with that storm. Research geologist Erica Lenz warns that our coast will see more major impacts in the decades to come. We could be looking at 11 feet of sea level rise if the Antarctic ice sheet collapse proceeds along the trajectory it's going. Lenz says that some of the greatest sea level rise predictions across the entire country are for right here in the Northeast. I don't think we're prepared at all, unfortunately. Uh, I think uh, this is going to be a huge, uh, multifaceted, very complicated problem. We have have some time right now to have productive conversations, but it's much better to act now than it is down the line when we're facing some really dire circumstances. For a home that's been in their family for nearly 80 years, the Barrys say no matter what happens, they'll build it back up again. It's worth all the aggravation that you have to go through, because in between it's heaven. So Eric, we can estimate what the flooding would be like today, given the surge from the blizzard of 78 and the sea level rise we've seen since then. This map is pretty eye-opening. Parts of Boston, you can see shaded in blue here, completely underwater, really just a snapshot of how vulnerable both the city and our coastline in New England is if a storm like that were to happen again today. It takes the right or wrong timing, depending on your perspective, and uh, we hope we don't have everything link up again. Exactly. All right, Danielle, thank you very much. And when we return, Pamela Gardner talks technology. Now versus then. And Barry Burbank visits with former WBZ meteorologist Bruce Schwegler. The Ion Weather Blizzard of 78 special returns right after this. University. Unlike this free romantic music, 
Aspen Dental offers an actually free exam for new uninsured patients. Schedule now at 1-800-ASPEN-DENTAL. The same sport hybrid super handling all-wheel drive system that powers the Acura Intercept, now available in the new RLS. Visit your New England Acura dealer for attractive offers on the RLX. It's date night in America, and roughly 21 million people are going out. Some will try trendy new hot spots, while others hit their old favorites. Either way, that's great for Daniel. He's done with his shift and is also ready for a night out. Only he's making some extra cash by driving with Uber. And by using Instant Pay, he can go from a five-star ride to a five-star surprise. Get your side hustle on. Sign up at uber.com slash drive now. Welcome back to the Blizzard of 78 Winter Special. WBZ meteorologist Pamela Gardner joining me now. And Pamela, the question on many people's minds, could the Blizzard of 78 actually happen again? Well, yes and no. So sure, we've had comparable storms in terms of snowfall. And just a few weeks ago, we had record high tides during the blizzard. But we've come a long way in 40 years in terms of preparedness and technology and learned some valuable lessons along the way. Paralyzing, isolating, the blizzard of 78. Still our benchmark storm for New England. I lived in Newburyport, Massachusetts when the blizzard of 78 hit. And my father, who actually worked in Boston, was stuck on the road uh, trying to get home. Dr. Flynn describes his memories, like many, from 40 years ago. Today, he heads the Global Resilience Institute at Northeastern University, specializing in disaster assessment and recovery. A big element of being prepared is being able to understand risk and how it will play out on things that you value. We have better forecasting tools now that allows us to know with a little more precision when something will hit. 40 years ago, we had one computer model. Today, there are dozens. Currently, the combined processing power of National Weather Service supercomputer is 5.78 petaflops, which is more than 10,000 times faster than the average desktop computer. And the data going into those computers comes from a wide variety of sources, from satellites, weather balloons, buoys, radar, to airplanes and ships. The communication has also vastly improved, and schools and businesses have adapted to the changing times. First of all, I'm watching the TV stations, probably WBC a lot. Marilyn Reed at Willow Hill School receives the information and takes action. One new concept is helping her decision-making process. Having the virtual day, knowing that there's no separation of school, I think is going to make the decision a lot easier. I am not going to be staying up into the middle of the night trying to decide whether we're going to have school tomorrow. All the students do have access to the technology at home. One of the things with the virtual learning days is, depending on the storm, you lose power. So we have hard copies that we distribute to the students. What can we do before the storm shows up to kind of lower our exposure? So something that now has almost become commonplace for us is to clear the roads in advance of a big snowstorm. That's so valuable not just to make things safer for people, that they won't be stranded. That's a good thing. But it is because we can clear the roads that much more quickly and get us all back to work uh, that much uh, more rapidly. Blizzards like that in 1978 will continue to happen. Records are meant to be broken, but it is our ability to predict, prepare, and recover that will make all the difference going forward. And if there's anybody who can speak to how far we've come in the last 40 years, it's our own Barry Burbank. That's right, Pamela. This isn't only the 40th anniversary of the infamous blizzard. It is also Barry's 40th year here at WBZ. Are you serious? You're serious, man. Time flies. You wouldn't be kidding fun. me, would you? Of course not. Barry started just a few <laughs> weeks after the blizzard, and fair to say, you've seen a couple of snowstorms since then. Mm, yeah, maybe. One or two. One or two. <laughs> yeah. But through all the storms and all the changes in TV, weather casting, nothing's quite measured up to that original blockbuster storm. Let's go to the weather map and see the Barry reason. joined BZ in March of 1978, but just weeks earlier was forecasting up in Portland, Maine, and couldn't believe what he was seeing. I started looking at this and saying, can this possibly happen? Could we have a storm of this magnitude? Is this computer model gone crazy or nuts? 
I was concerned about how they were going to handle it down here because it looked like it was going to be much more severe. Down here was his soon-to-be partner in forecasting, longtime BZ meteorologist Bruce Schwegler. We got a major flooding potential. You were the guy all those hours. You go outside at all tonight, you've got to be out of your gourd. Was it nonstop for you? It went for days and days, and I was very tired by the time I got done. <laughs> and uh, it was exciting, and there was a lot to do. So we're getting closer to the center of the low. Essentially, every hour or so, I was on the air day and night and <laughs> for five days. Now one of the problems we're having with day after day being stuck here is our outfits are getting a little gamey. <laughs> I did bring in a pair of underwear and a, and a t-shirt and everything else was the same, right? Don Kent was here at the beginning of the storm. Correct. I was looking at it with Don in the morning and Don was going for six to 12 inches. By the time I got into the afternoon and evening, I said, Jesus, double it. 10 to 20 inches of snow. And that's exactly how it started going up. It was a little late in starting, so people went to work on that Monday morning. All of a sudden, it was a wall of snow that came bang. Everybody got let out of work, so that's where the problems happened. All the roads around here, they were just shut down. I mean, they were just, the, the cars were like this with snow. They were going nowhere. Route 128 is totally closed. And it took, God, two, three days for them to get out of there. It had a long-lasting impact on the New England psyche. It established a platform of people being panicking for storms. Yep. People just, as soon as they hear a snow, they spangled. they're off right. to the and market. It, and then everybody's going, Jesus, what happened to all the bread? It's all gone. <laughs> Bruce, why do you think we're still talking about this 40 years later? It was a big deal because nothing like it ever occurred before and after. That is it. Whammo. It's this one and then it's all the other ones. Of course, Barry has seen a lot of other storms in his 40 years since. I can remember some big storms that happened, like the April Fool's blizzard of 1997. A few in 2005, we've had, of course, 2015. Everybody will remember that for all the snow we had in 30 days. And when it comes to TV coverage, he's seen a lot of things change, too. When I first started here, we just had two maps, and they were actual real maps in the studio. We almost needed a step ladder to get up and wash them off. Now we have a tremendous amount of computer guidance to help us with the forecasting. And now, with social media, I mean, we're constantly on it all the time. But through it all, that big blizzard at the outset of his BZ career has always stayed top of mind. This had so many factors to it, so many ingredients to make it the storm of the century. It's just nuts. It was, the whole thing was crazy. And the real spirit of New England, to me, came out. You had people opening up their homes to other people. Yep. Everybody became a friend to everybody else. You're absolutely correct. Boy, it was great catching up with Bruce. He was here for 33 years at WBZ, and the blizzard of 78 was his most memorable storm. You see some of the clips, and yeah. just in the moment, you could tell that he knew that that was something mm -hmm. that you might not see again. Right. Unbelievable. Great yeah. to see you guys chatting, and yes. a couple of legends of weather here in New England. And be sure to join us in early March as we celebrate Barry's incredible 40 years here at WBZ. And when we return, the entire WBZ weather team comes together for our Winter Weather Roundtable Part 2. But as we go to break, look back at one of the more unique Blizzard memories, thousands left stranded after the bean pot. It's going to be a new story all night as fans spend the night at the garden. How they're going to get home is the question. I don't know. I have no idea. I'm getting home on Southern Comfort and 7-Up. How are you all getting home tonight? We don't know. I'm staying here all night. We have a car here. It's parked in the parking lot next door. If we can't get home, we'll stay here and have a few beers till the bars close at 2. Hopefully I'll find some place in town to stay. Uh, not at the garden. No way at the garden. That 100 people did stay at the garden. Many just rolled. Welcome back to the Eye on Weather Blizzard of 78 special and late January, it's the midway point of winter. We're now past the coldest average temperature and we're past the average snowfall. So it's a good time to look back at our outlook and look forward 
to the second half because there's still a ways to go. So what have been the big headlines this winter? I think number one, it's got to be the cold that we saw starting Christmas Day and going into the start of January. That first week of January was the coldest on record across most of New England. We had pipes freezing. We had slurpy waves back on Nantucket. Mm -hmm. Ice chunks on Cape Cod. There are still significant ice jams around New England because of the thaw after we saw such thick ice develop on our rivers. So that cold, exceptional. Now we've had this January thaw, and we're actually going to end January pretty much with average temperatures. So things have balanced out a little bit. We called for that thaw. Don't think it's been an exceptional one for us, but it has at least given us a little break from winter. Uh, when it comes to snowfall, we're sitting right at average right now. About two feet in Boston so far, three feet in Worcester. So from that perspective, it looks to be like we're on track. So I think the question is, where do we go from here? A little La Nina update in a week to moderate phase and is expected to stay that way, often peaking and so in the winter months and may gradually ease as we head into spring, which can typically mean a milder finish, but it doesn't look like that'll be the case this time around. There's many more pieces to the puzzle we look at for that. And I don't think we're through with the cold by any means. No. No. The La Nina gives us the variability. Mm -hmm. We have other indices, like I love the QBO, which basically says we're going to go into more cold weather. Mm -hmm. I like the MJO, which is another fancy indice that gives us the chance of going into a cold phase now. So that uh, leads us to believe we're going to have a lot of cold weather ahead. It's all about the storms now. The MJO has really correlated well through exactly. this winter. Exactly. Everything so. is correlating well. Mm -hmm. They're phasing. It's brought that warm spell that we've just had and now switching as it descends right. into that colder phase going forward. Oh, speaking of the cold, we look to Siberia, other parts of the globe to see where the cold air is pooling and it's right over Siberia once again. A hundred below zero for some of those temperatures. Oh, that is <laughs> brutal. <laughs> Nothing like what we can expect here, but we'll have our next cold snap perhaps come February. Mm -hmm. It looks like mid-February to mid-March right now. It might be that time frame to watch for things to shift again. As Barry mentioned, La Niñas bring a lot of variability. I mean, we've gone from really cold to fairly mild with some of these storms. It looks like we're going back to that cold phase. So all told, our initial outlook, we called for about average snowfall. That looks to be pretty good, so long as we don't see a February <laughs> snow blitz, which right now it doesn't look likely. That was like a generational event. <laughs> Uh, when it comes to temperature, we probably have to adjust to a slightly colder than average winter. As right now, we're sitting colder than average, unless February is warmer than average, which it doesn't look like right now. I won't be able to make up that ground. So here we go. Little ways yet to go in wintertime. Even though we're going into colder phase, mm -hmm. we will not have a repeat of February 2015, right? No. I mean, that was just something that you're telling your grandkids about. That was amazing. Yeah. Nope. That won't happen again. Nope. Do not fear. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like to track all the changes, much more in-depth information on CBSBoston.com. And we'll be right back with our Blizzard of 78 special right after this. Well, that concludes our look back at the blizzard of 1978 and a look ahead to the rest of this winter. Remember, you can get live radar updated forecasts anytime on our WBZ mobile weather app. And as always, we would like to invite you to be a part of the team by joining the hundreds of WBZ weather watchers. Just log in to CBSBoston.com and sign up today. And be on the lookout for me and the rest of the team in our mobile weather lab, bringing you live conditions from inside the storms. Finally, if you would like to hear more about the blizzard of 1978, I'll be giving a talk this Saturday, February 3rd, along with some other local meteorologists who were in New England in 1978. Just log on to bluehill.org for more information. Well, we never root for destructive weather to come visit New England, but it does happen, and when it does, we hope that you trust the team that we put together here at WBZ for the latest information to get us all through the storm. Thanks for watching our Eye on Weather Blizzard of 78 special. Try to enjoy the rest of this winter season. I'm Jane Pauley, and this is Sunday morning, a Grammy Sunday morning to be exact. Music's biggest party is tonight, broadcast right here on CBS. We'll be hearing from singers and musicians throughout the morning, and not just living performers. Some are no longer with us, but their living image endures, thanks to technical wizardry, as David Pogue will report in our cover story. 
Maria Callas, one of the greatest opera singers who ever lived and died. Well, she's back. So how is it that you are launching a tour of Maria Callas? The holographic image will perform. The only thing that will be recorded sound-wise is her voice, and then everything else will be live. Coming up on Sunday morning, the live performances of the future might feature stars who are never really there. Ed Sheeran is a hugely popular singer and songwriter who is very much alive and up for two Grammys tonight. This morning, he's sharing a snack with our Mark Phillips. It's a journey that began on the rocky shores of England. I'll get to eat fish and chips.